you know, I'm a child of the 60s and into the 70s. And um, so Pittsburgh, when I was, you know, when I was growing up was pretty, was pretty black and white. Uh, there, there definitely was an undercurrent of racial tension. I mean, I can remember, you know, uh, when I was, when I was first with my, my, my parents, uh, we were in an area of the city called Manchester. Manchester was basically the black community. Uh, and at a certain point, my dad, you know, made some money. He's like, ah, we're going to, we're moving out. <laughs> we're going to do the George Jefferson. That wasn't on yet, but that's what we did. But I remember, you know, moving to this, uh, area that was basically kind of a, uh, working class white area, blue collar white area. And, you know, moving into that community was, uh, it was a little, it was a little stressful because, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I was used to being able to go out, go across the street, hook up with my friends, knock on the door, you know, chill, have fun with, with kids in the hood, in the neighborhood. And now all of a sudden you, you know, you go next door and you're like, can they come out to play? They're like, no, <laughs> bam. And <laughs> you get some of that. And then, and then, you know, there were, there were kids, you know, that I did make friends with, but I think the biggest thing that I remember, and um, this isn't a story that I tell too much, but the biggest thing that I remember was uh, in terms of, like I say, the kind of the racial tension and in the weirdness of growing up during that period. So I had a father who at the time was on, was a detective on the uh, Pittsburgh police force. He was in the juvenile division. And so this kind of, you know, like I said, working class, uh, blue collar, white neighborhood that I lived in, uh, made a couple of friends there. So one day I go over to this kid's house. I can't say names, but I go over to this kid's house and uh no save the story i was gonna ask you that for tell so i know where you're going with that i was gonna ask oh, you okay, that for okay. tells from the hood all right save that story all right oh, okay all right. well i will just i will just end it i will just say this pittsburgh 60s into the 70s uh a lot of racial tension um you know i, I can remember going with my parents to look for houses in certain neighborhoods you would show up with the realtor and they'd be like ah oh, we decided we're not selling now you know stuff like that um, so, you know, it was kind of interesting, but, uh, I, you know, you find some friends, you fight, you, but, 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 you know, and, and then I always appreciated going to church because when I go to church, the church was still black back in the, in the neighborhood and you would, you know, get to reconnect with your homies from back there, which was, you know, so I, you know, you end up in this kind of like, uh, you end up with a split personality because on one hand you're going back to hang out with your friends who are black that you knew, you know, from, you know, almost birth. And then on the other, on the other side, you're in a school and you're dealing with people who really aren't like you. Some, some you get along with, some you don't. And now you have to kind of traverse and, and kind of, you know, deal, deal in these choppy waters. But do you think that experience helped you navigate like Hollywood? Because I, this is my personal experience. Like I grew up in East Orange, which is 99.9% .9 black people, right? I went to Loyola in Baltimore. I know you went down there in New Orleans. And like I struggled, I just struggled navigating white people. But I noticed people that kind of grew up around white people had an easier experience. Like they understood them better. Do you think that helped you with your career? You know, I never really thought about it like how you're uh, posing the question to me, but probably because, yeah, you, you, you have more experience. You have more experience. You know, things, you know, what to look for. I, I guess maybe you can, you can kind of make judgments on if somebody's genuine yeah. or, or not and how they're dealing with you. Um, I, 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 you know, because there, there are people that will give you lip service to uh, an idea, a thought, a belief, yeah. but you can look past it and go, that's not really where they're coming from. <laughs> they really yeah. think that I'm less than. And then on the flip side, you'll meet some people and you, you can tell that they genuinely accept you just as a person. And that, 
I think that's something that, you know, just growing up around a lot of, a lot of white people, you, you, start to, you start to be able to understand that uh, maybe that's something that you had to pick up a little later on. Yeah. If your grandmother bought you a TV, right? You watch uh, George Romero's Night of the Living Dead on Billy Chili, Billy Cardell's. Uh, check this brother out. He's an interesting guy on Chili Theater, right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, how did Romero's style of horror film shape your understanding of how to create realistic, scary characters? I noticed you don't do the monsters. You turn the humans into, I guess, a monster type of right. character. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and why... Uh, give me a second. I'm blanking on the actor's, uh, the, the lead, the black actor's name that was in um, Night of the Living Dead now. Um, yeah, go, go, go ahead and look it up real quick. Dwayne Jones. Dwayne Jones, thank you. So, okay, so Night of the Living Dead, you know, when I saw that as a kid, number one, it was just scary as hell. I mean, you know, it's, it's black and white, kind of weird these things kind of walking strange. It's like the first real zombie, zombie movie. And, you know, and he, he kind of took the tack that Orson Welles did on radio with uh, um, the, the, the space, oh, what was that thing called? The Space Invader movie where everyone thought that this was a real thing. So when you, you look at Night of the Living Dead, it's, it's almost shot slightly like, this is happening now. <laughs> You know, they cut to the TV, uh, uh, TV studio and this, that, and the other. And you're like, oh, this, this is going down. It, it, fit, it has that kind of urgency to it. But it had uh, Dwayne as the lead in this thing, this black man who, you know, I don't think Romero wrote it to be black, but this was the best actor available. So to George Romero's credit, he's like, the hell with it. <laughs> I, he's going to be black. I just need somebody that can play this role. So, you know, great kudos to him for that. That's kind of like what we were talking about with white people to just go, I, you know, I don't care. I don't see, the color isn't important to me. It's what you possess as a, as a human being, what you can bring to the table. So anyhow, the, 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 the offshoot of that was now you have this black guy playing a role that could have been, you know, written uh, exclusively for a white person doing things that I had never seen a black man do in a movie before. There, I mean, there's a point where the, this white lady is like, oh, my God, and he slaps her. And you're like, oh, he, that what? <laughs> you can slap white bitches? I didn't know. I, I, mean, I probably shouldn't curse on this. You can slap white women. I didn't know <laughs> that you could do that and get away with it. Um, so he, he's like the lead of this thing. Now, how that affected me and, you know, where I kind of went with uh, Tales from the Hood and Horror later and, and the idea that what is really frightening is, is, the, is us. As, as people, you know, because as I, I grew up, you know, okay, well, there's, there's no zombies, but even if you look at Night of the Living Dead, so much of what is, what, uh, of the conflict in that movie are the people that are trapped in the house trying to avoid the, the, the zombies. And ultimately, uh, our hero, Dwayne, gets killed at the end of the movie by people not by zombies, but by people who don't see him uh, as just a, a, not a zombie, but a, a, a normal person walking about. You made, a, you made a documentary in grade school? Yes, I made a documentary. I don't remember ever saying this. So I don't know where Fine, you This is what we do. Don't pay it no mind. This is what we do. Yo. We got to prepare Anyhow, for Anyhow, okay, yeah, I made a documentary in grade school. Uh, I was in Annunciation grade school. Um, a white Catholic school. I'm not Catholic. Obviously, I'm not white. Um, but uh, <laughs> I did this documentary where I went out and I shot it on eight millimeter film, and then I had a cassette player. And I was asking people, I, if I recall correctly now, 
you know, what they thought about certain racial issues and black white. And I, so I hold on, I just hold on. You were you did a as a kid, you made a documentary asking people about racial issues. Yeah, I'm telling you, dude, this is how I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> so, How were they responding to these questions? Like, what were people saying about what you were doing at the time? You know, um, I don't. I, I probably didn't approach anybody that was insane, but I did talk to you know black and white, which is pretty much all there was in Pittsburgh at the time. And maybe unless you went out to the university area, there was some Asians or something else. But, um, but I, I remember shooting it and playing it for, I, I guess it was our social studies class or something, probably seventh or eighth grade. Um, and, you know, I, I had, I had the, the video, the, not the video, but the film. And, of course, I, I had to cut it myself. And then I had the, <laughs> the sound on just a, a, a cassette, I guess, probably at the time, or maybe it was reel to reel. I can't remember. My my dad had a reel to reel player, and um, you know, so the sound didn't necessarily match up to the heads. So you would see the, the heads talking, and I go, "Well, this is what I feel about you know the racial situation." <laughs> but it was all it was all a little crazy. But that was the first thing that I ever shot and put together. And like I said, it was a, it was kind of a docu style thing. Uh, it was probably some some project that we had to do for social studies, and this is what I decided to do. All right, and also tell me about the stand up you were doing at that time. Well, stand up came uh, when I was in high school. I started kind of dabbling in stand up. Um, uh, you you may not you may not pick this up just from you know me sitting here and the job that I do, but I, I'm a pretty quiet person generally speaking. I would say. I consider myself an introvert normally, but yeah, okay, right on. I feel you. Um, but in for some reason, uh, I was drawn to acting and and kind of performing. And maybe it's because those are two 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 uh, areas that you're really in control. Uh, of of what's happening you know as an actor you're on stage but you got lines you have dialogue as a stand-up comedian you have a microphone you're expressing what you want to say and if somebody comes back at you you if you're if you're good you kill them you know you, you you're not it's, it's different than being in a situation where you're just walking into a party. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if you can talk to this person or that person. So there was a, the stand-up for me kind of came out of, you know, my desire to perform. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I love prior. I mean, you know, I, I, I used to be able to, re I could at one point in my life probably recite verbatim about five or six Richard Pryor albums front to back doing all the voice hey, oh, oh, and all the weird Richard Pryor ah, voices that he used to do and weird stuff and and also really like George Carlin he was like you know uh from the from the white comedian side he was like the liberal weird offbeat hippie comic that you know kind of dealt with some social things and he would always you know poke at uh, hypocrisy and I, I really appreciated I really appreciated that so um, I started doing stand-up you know in, in high school basically and then I became I became school council president at um, so my first year in high school I went to a public school Oliver High which was dead set in the middle of uh, all the, all the white people lived over here for the most part. All the black people lived over here for the most part. Um, the cemetery divided the two. And the school sat right across the street from the cemetery. Now we had by that time moved to the, to the white side of the, of the thing, but I still knew kids on the black side. And um, I can just remember that. That was, that was a strange time because you know, I had I had friends in both places, but the friends in both places did not connect at all. Yeah, uh, and then after a year there, I ended up at um, 
uh, a school called Swickley Academy. And the reason I ended up there was Oliver, uh, though I had some friends there and I was in some advanced program, I remember my dad was at this point had left, he was no longer a detective. He uh, had started his social work career and he did a lot of social work. He worked with convicts, he worked with uh, job programs, you know, that sort of thing. And, um, but he was also on the Pittsburgh Public School Board. And the reason I ended up at Oliver, the public school, after going for uh, all these years to a Catholic school, was the, the, there was an article in the paper that said that all of the Pittsburgh Public School Board members, their kids were all in private school. So my dad was like, you gotta go to public school. So I went to Oliver High for that one year and the school was so bad, um, it just, I, I just knew I wasn't gonna get a great education. So I remember one day I told my dad, I was like, look, my athletic ability is not great. <laughs> <laughs> All I got is a brain. <laughs> I got to get out of here. <laughs> and my, my grandmother had worked as a domestic in an area called Swickley Heights, which were a lot of uh, like uh, the Mellons or the Carnegie's, or the, you know, a lot of rich family, oil money, train money, steel money mostly. Mostly steel money, not too much oil money, steel money. Uh, came from there. And, um, and she told me, she's like, oh, there's Sw Swickley Academy. So I, I said, I want to go to Swickley Academy. I didn't know what the hell I was in for with that. But I ended up out there. And that was a very, uh, you know, it was a lot of preppy white kids back before preppy was even cool. I mean, there was a point where black people adopted preppy and really, and really flipped the switch on it. But this preppy, there were no fancy colors, there were no purple Izod shirts or anything like that. It was a white, green, black, and I think that was it. <laughs> that, those were the colors of Izod back then. And uh, somehow I became school council president because I could get up in front of a microphone and express what I wanted to express, so. What did the ask though, right? Um, is there a similarity between the timing in comedy and acting? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would say comedy is, the rhythms of comedy serve not just acting, but actually helped me a lot in writing and directing. Because how you construct a scene, how you construct a, a, a performance even, um, you're looking for the beats. And comedy is all about the beats and rhythm, you know. I mean, you'll hear some comedians that you'll laugh not even so much because of the, the, of the joke, but because of the rhythm. They, they create a rhythm, and you know when you hear that rhythm, ba -da -ba -bum, oh, that's supposed to be funny. You just laugh, you know. <laughs> it may not be funny at all. <laughs> <laughs> or if the average person, if you read what they said, and the average person said it, you're like, eh, there's nothing funny about that. But because Cat Williams said it a certain way, Chappelle said it a certain way, Bernie Mac was a master of that. <laughs> the tone, the tonality of the voice. Yeah, you know, and you know, bam, that's, and you know, they were, they were, the, the, the routines could be funny as well. But all of that translates really well into, it's helped me a lot anyhow, in terms of writing, um, directing, and you know, I, I, I tell people, I was like, you know, if any, anybody that can direct comedy can direct drama. I don't know that all the people that direct drama could direct comedy, because in drama you can be a little, things can, things can slide a little bit more, if, if you kind of understand what I'm saying, but in, in comedy, if it's not like this, punch. It really got to hit. Punch. I got shot. You know, you're not going to get the, the joke doesn't happen. So if you can translate that to drama, it's, it's going to, it, it still works. It's, it still works because you're still working to a beat, to a moment that has to pay off. How the heck did you end up on Hollywood Shuffle? Uh, that's because I, I was, I was doing stand up and, and acting. So Robert Townsend, 
Um, you know, he was out here. He was doing his stand-up at the Comedy Store. Uh, Keenan uh, Wayans, um, I'm in the Alpha. I, I, I pledged A Phi A. Keenan is Alpha. Now, he didn't pledge me, but I met him because um, I went to USC, University of Southern Cal. We used to have insane parties. Like Eddie Murphy would come to our parties. <laughs> you serious? I'm totally serious. He, he, he came through. Uh, Keenan probably told him about it or somebody like that. But, you know, we would have, you know, we were known for having these really amazing parties. Uh, anyhow, because of my connection there, uh, when Robert uh, Townsend started to put together kind of his troop for Hollywood Shuffle, um, I was one of the people that, you know, was there. And, there, and they were casting, he had casting directors. He had uh, uh, Tony Livingston and Jackie, oh, what's Jackie's last name? Jackie Brown. And uh, uh, they, you know, they, they pulled together all these different people. And then doing Hollywood Shuffle was just such a, that was such a, f a fun thing because, you know, we, there was all, all this troupe of black actors that Robert put together. Brilliant um, black actors at that. Let's say again? No, I said brilliant black actors at that. Oh, yeah. There were, I mean, there were some really good people and people that went on to do, you know, some big things. But, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was just a, it, there was like a sense of community. Nobody else was doing anything like that at the time. There weren't a lot of opportunities for black performer for black actors, young black actors. Um, and the ones that were out there were, you know, kind of the stereotypical things, which the movie obviously makes fun of. You know, you're, you're going to be a pimp, you're going to be a drug dealer. I mean, I, I played a drug dealer in a movie, uh, in a TV show. It was called Magruder and Loud with uh, Esther Roll was my mother. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know Esther from Good Times. And, and, and Akuso Abusie who played opposite um, uh, Whoopi in, in Color Purple was, was my girlfriend. I got killed really quick because I was with a Kusawa driving a, a Porsche or some. I was doing some. I was doing some ill stuff. But so with Robert's thing, though, you got to do all these different characters. You got to make fun of that, uh, that attitude that Hollywood had about, you know, black black people and how they saw them, how they put them into certain situations exclusively. Um, I'm not sure if you know this, but like, where did he get funding? I always wonder, where did he get funding for that movie? That's like a revolutionary movie because he's really kind of poking fun at, you know, the, the issues in Hollywood. So where did he get funding for Hollywood Shuffle? Um, Ro I mean, the initial funding was just Robert. I mean, Robert had done a couple of, couple of things. He, 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 was, he was making money doing stand-up. I think he had already done, I think he had already done Soldier Story, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but he was kind of a working actor. And then he, he, you know, he said he was charging stuff up on his credit cards. That was like his big thing, charging, charging stuff up on his credit cards. Now, of course, we were all working for free. <laughs> <laughs> there was no hold on the, the actors on Hollywood shuffle were just working for free initially um, right. because there you know what there was nothing there, there there was there there weren't all the opportunities that you see that black actors have now so there was nothing out there so it was like yeah I want to act Robert's like hey man I'm gonna do this thing I'm, you know we're gonna get together and blah 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 and I'm like all right well you know I got anything to do let's go <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, you you would you, we 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 would uh, um, you know what you call steal locations because you know he he couldn't afford to get locations. So like if you look at the scene where we're all slaves, we you know all right, meet me at five in the morning at the corner of so and so. We're gonna go up into this park and shoot this before anybody comes out <laughs> as the sun is coming up. And that's what we did. You know, you'd show up, you'd bring your clothes, and he would figure out what worked for uh, different things. And, you know, that's, that's how it went until 
he uh, got Samuel Goldwyn to pick up the movie. So he shot all this stuff, he edited it, uh, it got a lot of it together, you know, and then Samuel Goldwyn saw the film and then they put some money into it for Robert to finish it and uh, to Robert's credit and to Samuel Goldwyn's credit, they, they ended up paying all the actors. I still get like little tiny residuals from Hollywood <laughs> Shuffle. That's a good look, man. All right, I'm yeah. glad to hear that. <clears throat> um, lessons you learned from Robert Towson and also did you see the brilliance in Keenan Ivory Wayne's early on in those early years when you were around him? Yeah, I mean, you know, both Robert and Keenan, um, I mean, you could just tell that they had, they had, they had something. Keenan uh, was, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm think he wrote some of that stuff uh, with, with Robert. They were, they were kind of partners at the time. And, you, you know, you could kind of, you could, you could feel that something was going to break, you know, for Keenan uh, eventually, uh, which, of course, it did with uh, In Living Color. Um, but, yeah, both of them, man, just, just, you know, just really smart, clever, funny, funny guys. I think what was the most surprising on Keenan's side was how deep the talent went in his family. That's pretty wild, yeah, yeah. You know, that's a <laughs> that's lot. Pretty, that's kind of disturbing, actually. You know, there's a lot of people there. You know? That's that's right. that's ins that's insane. I heard you tell this story. I want to hear it again now that you're distance, because I know as you get older, uh, people have a different perception of their experience. Going to Atlanta to shoot school days, right? How did you even get linked up with Spike Lee? Once again, that was. Uh, um, so the same two ladies that, um, oh no, I take that back. It wasn't, it wasn't Tony, it wasn't Tony and Jackie. It was Robbie Reed. So Robbie Reed, who I'd met years earlier at a place called Inner City Cultural Center, which was like a black, um, theater space in Los Angeles. Uh, a lot of people used to come through there, Ted Lang and, and Marla Gibbs, and they would do shows. Um, so I met Robbie there, and then somewhere along the line, Robbie became a casting director. So when Spike, you know, was doing, getting ready to do school days, she called people in, you know, I did a, I think I did a reading for her or something, and she put us on tape, and, um, and then you get, you know, you get a call, it's like, oh, um, you got a part, Spike wants to meet you. And so now everybody auditioned for the leads. I mean, when you, when you read, you were either, you know, if, if you were a guy, you were either reading for Giancarlo Esposito's role or you for Lawrence Fishburne's role. It was, you know, those were the two big roles. So I was, I was, I read for Giancarlo Esposito's role, uh, Big Brother Almighty. And, <laughs> and, you know, so then you go and you meet Spike and you realize, you know, that's not the role you got. I'm your big brother, Chucky. But I met him at, um, I met him at uh, the Chateau Marmont. That's, he, he loves that place. He would be there a lot. And I went in, and it was the first time I met Spike. And he was just like, he was so enthusiastic. <laughs> He's like, ah, they don't know what they did, giving me $5 million. I'm going to mess them up. He didn't say it like that. And I, I don't want to, you know. He, but he's like, I'm, I'm going to show these something. I'm going to, I'm going to use he, this He was money. big at the time, right? Like Spike Lee was at the, like, he was very big at that time, right? He, well, this was his first big thing after. Um, she's got to have it. After she's got to have it. Man. It was his first big thing after she's got to have it. And, and he was just so, he was so hyped about it. He's like, they, they don't know what they did giving me this money. Because <laughs> he he he's he's ready to set the world on fire, um, which I think he eventually did when he got to you know uh, uh, some of his other films. How was that movie for you? Being that you were you had that fraternity experience and what they were highlighting about the fraternity. It was interesting because you know it, and and it, it's <laughs> I wouldn't say that this in terms of my particular frat, but 
there was a lot of truth to what he was dealing with in terms of fraternities, um, in terms of... Uh, the hazing or the colorism? The hazing, probably the hazing, but a bit of the colorism. Uh, I mean, you can see it sometimes, and not as much anymore, but, you know, there was, there was a point where you would look at the AKAs and it was hard to find a dark AKA. On the West Coast also? I thought that would be more like a East Coast, down South thing. It was on the West Coast like that? You would, you, you would just kind of see it. I'm not saying that it was always, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. you know, they, they kind of had the, the cues were always dark and like ready to throw down. And the alphas were these little guys like me, <laughs> you know. Was, but th that's a generalization. But so some, I would say some of that was there for sure. Um, I would say the other thing that, that probably was there in terms of the frat side is kind of the, the attitude towards women. I mean, you know, you're in, you're in college, young guys anyhow all, all mostly have a, you know, a one-track mind and how they're dealing with, with ladies. You put a bunch of them together and it just spirals up. So some of the things that he played around with, or he well, played around is the wrong word, but that he uh, uh, kind of wrote within the script of school days, I think were, were honest. Now, I would say that I feel like, and this is what movies do, um, he heightened it. He, 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 he took it to a level that isn't what was there, but you know, that's part of the filmmaking process. You know, you don't, you don't go to a movie to see your life. You go to a movie to see something extraordinary and how people are going to get out of bigger, more extraordinary situations, which is why, you know, you rarely see anybody in an action film shave in the morning or go to the bathroom. It's, it's like, we're not interested in that. We just want the big stuff, you know? Um, with school days, right? Uh, it inspires you to write a film, Another Class? Yeah, well, between Spike, Robert Townsend, and uh, some classes that I had at, at USC, because um, I, I wasn't a film major, major I, was a, I, I had three degrees. I ended up with philosophy of religion, um, uh, public relations, and a theater degree. Yeah, those are my three degrees. Um, but one of the things I saw, uh, a class that I had there was a, a film, kind of a film uh, criticism class, and different, different directors would come in. So John Sayles, if you know who he is, came in. Uh, and John Sayles was a, you know, kind of an indie director. He did Brother from Another Planet, those kind of I know movies. That one, right. I know yeah, that one, right. yeah. But he had one called The Sakaka Seven that was about a group of friends that just got together over the weekend. And then, uh, so I saw that in school, and then later I saw uh, um, a movie called The Big Chill uh, that Lawrence Kasdan wrote and directed, which was also about a group of friends that you know haven't seen each other for a while, get together over a weekend. And so that, that became um, kind of a template for me for the other class, which was about a, a group of black friends that get together and haven't seen each other a while over, over a weekend. And obviously uh, Spike and Robert, and particularly Spike, I guess at this point, because I remember in doing school days, there were people uh, among the crew that was like, I, you know, I don't like how Spike has the movie ending, just wake up or whatever. And Spike was like, look, if you don't, you don't like it, write your own damn film. This is my film, you write a film. And you know, I, I was like, yeah, you know, he's right. It's easy to criticize what somebody has done, but to put yourself out there and create, that's a whole different thing, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, I found, I found that to be kind of a, an inspiring, inspiring thing. Now, I didn't have any problem with how the movie ended. I, I, I liked the whole thing, but I did like Spike's directness and how he dealt with, with that you know, that question that came back to him is like, this is my movie. <laughs> you, know, like, you, you can write a movie, go do your thing. Um, go ahead. I, I was going to ask the, uh, I don't know how to say it, the Black Anthropy movie. Um, Black Anthropy? 
Yeah. Oh, was the, that around oh, the same the, time? That was too? a play that I wrote, Black Anthony. Oh, that was a play. All right. Yeah. So that was uh, the disease of being black and wealthy. So, okay. Yeah. So um, I wrote this play called The Black Horror Show, or uh, the subtitle was Black Anthropy. It was based on the concept of lycanthropy or lycanthropy, which is the disease of being a, a werewolf, a, a lycra throat. That's a, that's a werewolf. Uh, so lycanthropy was the disease of being black. And it was a play where a, a, very, uh, a, a very assimilated black businessman goes to the hood for career day, which he doesn't want to do because he doesn't want to go to the hood. He doesn't want to be around these tired mofos. So he does, he go, but he goes. And while he's there, this Rastafarian dude comes up and like shakes his hand really hard. And he, he, he like goes back to his offices like days later. And he's like, he starts having these, he starts having these kind of fits where anytime he hears um, I think it was it a it was a Miles Davis. I can't remember the track. It was a jazz track. He he starts like kind of going outside of himself. It's like he wants to take off his tie. He 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 doesn't want to process his hair. He you know he's like he all of a sudden he's into really big butts. And he was with the flat butts for a while. And he he ultimately this this Rastafarian when he shook his hand is like you know he. He dug his fingernails in and, and there was an exchange of some blood. And now he is going through this process where he becomes a, a Black Panther. But like a, in, the, in the horror movie, you become a werewolf. He becomes a Black Panther, but a Black Panther. He's like, all of a sudden he wants a beret. He wants a leather jacket. You know, it's Huey Newton is <laughs> his dude. And it's all like that. So... That was, that was uh, the Black Horror Show, and then that, that kind of informed some of what we ended up doing uh, with Tales from the Hood. The, another class, that, that they used some of that for House Party too? Uh, no, but I, so the other class, that script got me the job of writing House Party too. So, so, you know, Reggie Hudlin and Warrington Hudlin, who ironically I had met during school days because they, they shot the behind the scene footage for Spike while we were doing school days. So I saw them down in Atlanta when we were doing that. And then obviously they did uh, the first house party that Reggie directed and he didn't want, he didn't want to do uh, two for, for whatever reason. And, uh, I was one of the few <laughs> black writers at the time that actually had a script that New Line could look at, and it was the other class script. And then I went and met him and, and pitched, you know, pitched an idea for how to do uh, House Party Two. All right, I have to ask you this, right? What came first? Because they both came out in 1993, from what I understand. Fear of the Black Hat or CB4? Oh, very interesting question. So. <laughs> I had, I had been trying to get Fear of a Black Hat done for a few years by the time we finally um, got a, a production deal on it. Uh, I shot, you know, once again, you know, I'm just learning from the people that come bef came before me. So I saw Robert do uh, uh, Hollywood Shuffle. I would seen Spike's career, you know, um, with... Uh, She's got to have it in uh, Joe's Barbershop. Um, they cut heads. Um, and so I was like, okay, so this is the template. You got you to do, you got to create something. I had shot a film, I shot a short that was supposed to be the other class. Never got it off the ground. I had the script, I had a short. We shot that on 35 millimeter film. Uh, for Fear of a Black Hat, um, I didn't have enough money to sh do what we did for the other class because shooting 35 is expensive, even if you're shooting short ends. Um, so we shot that. Uh, I had a friend that, that had connections at Compton Cable. Uh, Compton in the hood out here, Compton Cable was public access cable. 
company, and they would, you know, they would give out equipment if you said that you had something that could go on their air. Um, so we hooked up with my buddy, Perry. We got this equipment. We shot a 20-minute short called The Trial of NWH. And NWH was niggas with hats. It was like a takeoff of NWA. So we niggas with hats. We had a bunch of hats. And why it was the trial of NWH is because this was just right after, during that time where uh, Luther Cameron and Two Live Crew had, uh, you know, they'd been arrested a few times for uh, profanity on stage. And I was like, okay, so I was a Spinal Tap fan, if you know that film by Rob Reiner, uh, about a, a rap group, uh, not a rap group, a rock group called Spinal Tap. And, and I was like, okay, I want to do a kind of a Spinal Tap thing, uh, but I'm going to make it about a group that kind of is a little bit like Two Live Crew in that they're so profane, they're on death row. That was the idea. That it's like, what could you say? <laughs> it would be so bad that people would arrest you and say you got to die for it. So we did, we did this little 20-minute short. Um, and then as I started to show this short around, every place that we took it, they were like, well, you know, there's, Chris Rock has a thing that he's doing that's going to be like a black spinal tap. So you should stand, go away. <laughs> Just go away. And I was like, all right. So... I, I chased that for about a year, year and a half, and then I got a call from someone uh, at this company, uh, and she, they called ITC. And you know, this was back in the days of answering machines. There, there were no cell phones, so you had to go home and press the button and hear what somebody had to say. And she's like, "Oh, we saw your short for NWH. We'd really like to make that movie." I didn't call her back. I thought it was a friend. It had been so long since I had put this out. I was like, somebody is just effing with me. One of my friends is just effing with me. So I didn't even call back. I was like, who, the hell? who is this? And then about a week or so later, she called again. She's like, no, seriously, this is Lori Shackelford. We want to make your, we want to make your movie. Call me back. So I called her back, and I go out to the ITC um, offices out in the valley, and they're like, yeah, 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 it was really funny, blah, blah, blah. I learned my first lesson um, about what not to say. <laughs> in a meeting, which is, if you made something cheap, never say how cheap you made it for. Um, that movie, the, the short, that was about 20 minutes, and we had like two or three songs in it. The song My Peanuts, which ended up in the movie, was in there. Booty Juice, which ended up in the movie, was in there. And uh, cost us about $600 to do that 20 minutes. So I was like, I was really proud. I was like, yeah, it only cost us $600. And they're like, oh, well, $600, 20 minutes, you can make a whole movie for like $1,800, right? I was like, no. <laughs> so I was like, never tell them how much it costs. Um, so it, we ended up, they, they didn't want to say it was a million dollar film. So our budget, our budget was, uh, our, our budget going into production was like $999,999 and 40 some odd cents. And How was that for you, bro? You going from from spending six hundred dollars to getting that much money for a film? Like, how was that? It it, it was crazy. Um, but you know, it's like I was so young at the time. You know, I didn't. Re you don't. I I was blessed with naivete. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like now. I mean, I don't know that I could do some of the moves that I made now because I know too much. I know that. It's, it can't work like that, you know? And that, that's like one of the roadblocks I think that, you know, having too much knowledge can present because you're like, that's just not how things happen. But when you don't know and you just like, hell with it, let's go. Um, so it was, it, was pretty, it, it was pretty cool, but I was doing so much all at one time I didn't have a lot of time to think about it in that way. Um, I was, I, I do remember that, you know, when you, uh, when you do a movie, uh, you get bonded. If you're not working with a studio, you get bonded. And a bond company basically is an insurance company that is, is uh, protecting 
the money going into the film. So they're saying that we're going to make sure that you finish this film. Uh, and if you don't, then it comes back to us. We gotta, we're going to have to throw money in or whatever to make sure that the film gets done. Uh, so when I was, we had our offices in the Valley, and this was before we started shooting, and the Bond Company guy came in to talk. And it just so happened that when he came in to talk, I had put in a call to Spike to, to see if he could give me advice on something. I don't know if it was on, on casting or getting the casting director or what it was. But the Bond guy is sitting there, and the telephone rings, and one of the office workers says, Rusty, yes, Spike Lee is on the phone. So he was like, all right, you in. <laughs> you got Spike calling you. You're good. <laughs> That's all the validation you needed. Yeah, that was it. You know, that was that was co-signed and done. Uh, but it was a it was a fun it was a fun project, man. It was a really fun project. Tales from the Hood, now, right? Um, obviously, it got to like a Twilight Zone. Obviously, Twilight Zone influenced gave you an influence there. All right. Um, for this this for this movie now, from what I understand, you got a six million dollar budget, right? What role did Spike Lee play in you getting the funding for the movie? If he played any role at all, he played everything. Um, I wouldn't have, that that movie got made because of Spike. Um, so let's see. I, I so I did Fear of a Black Hat. We got that off the ground. It, it you know it did what it did. Uh, it didn't come out before CB4. It should have come out. It could have come out before CB4, but ITC, the company that uh, we made the movie for, thought that CB4 would create a bigger interest for their film because CB4 was a universal movie. It had you know, a bigger star and had more money behind it. Um, no shade on CB4, but all I will say is money doesn't necessarily equal funny, okay? <laughs> Um, it's what you put on the screen. Um, so we came out afterwards, which turned out not to be a good thing because CB4 didn't really bust things open like that. But we got a lot of people that watched it. One of those was Spike, who, who saw it. I didn't even know he saw it, but he, you know, Spike is up on everything. He saw it. So um, I was at a, his premiere out here for Girl 6. That was the one, the telephone one. Um, and uh, I was at the, after the premiere, well, here's another fun Hollywood story. This is how Hollywood works. Um, so after the premiere, I was in the lobby. I think it was at the, might have been at the Directors Guild or some Writers Guild, one of those places. And I was in the lobby, and there was a couple of uh, ladies, and I was trying to talk to one of them, and they just shut me down. I mean, it was like, they had no time. I mean, it was, it was brutal, you know? And <laughs> so I'm like, hey. And so I turned like this. When I turned like this, Spike came out of the screen and he's like, yo, Rusty, I like Fear of a Black Hat. What you getting ready to do next? I'm like, I'm working on this horror film called um, Tales from the Hood. Send it to me. I'm going to do it. And he walked away. <laughs> And I was like, damn. And then these two girls bounced back in front of me. I was like, what the? <laughs> They're like, hi, hi. I'm like, oh, I see how Hollywood works. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Right, so, uh, <laughs> that's crazy. All right. So um, you, you're doing Tales from the Hood, right? Uh, you touch on some serious topics, because Tales of the Hood is obviously it's a classic movie, and it's unique in the fact that it's a horror movie. Right, but it touches on these social issues, and it's not like err in your face, you know, it's intertwined in the story. So, you have the uh police brutality, you have the racism, you have the corrupt politicians, right? The one I wanted to talk about, which you were telling the story earlier, was about the domestic abuse and the child abuse. Ah, yeah. Um, and, and from what I understand, you're, you had a personal experience or you, you witnessed something that influenced that story. And that story in the, the, the movie was called, what, uh, Boys Do Get uh, Bruised? Yeah, Boys Don't 
Boys Don't Cry or something like Boys that. Boys Don't Cry. All right, yeah, all right. I can't, I, I'm oh. kind of blanking on what, what the name is now. But yeah, that was the one with David Allen Greer and, and Paula J. Parker. Um, yeah, so, okay, so uh, this neighborhood that I moved into after we left the black neighborhood, this, this uh, blue collar white neighborhood where I, where I made some friends. So one day I went over to this kid's house and we're just going to play. We're going to play in the basement, you know, of this back east. You, you got the, the basements and the, with the dirt floors a lot of times, yeah. it's just old, you know, old school basements. And uh, we would go down there and play and, you know, just throw balls or whatever the hell we were doing down there. Um, so I go to his house and, you know, you would, usually you would go through the kitchen. There would be a door in the kitchen and the stairs would go down to the, to the cellar. And he opens up the door and his little sister, who was maybe, I don't know, five or six, she was hogtied and gagged with facing the wall. She was on her knees, with her hands tied behind her back, her feet tied, and a gag in her mouth. And I was like- How this is that? That's exactly what I, you know, I didn't frame it that way because I was probably nine or 10 at the time, maybe 10, 10, 10, 11, somewhere in there. Um, but it was, it was, I was like, what? You know, I'm like, dude, what? <laughs> what's this? And he's like, oh, she, you know, she did something bad or, you know, I don't, you know, she's being punished. And then he's like, okay, let's go downstairs. So we went downstairs and we're playing and then I lay, leave and she's still there. And it just messed with me, man. It was like, I knew it was wrong and I knew it was jacked up, um, you know, and there were a lot, there, there were a couple of dysfunctional families in the neighborhood. White, white dysfunctional families. And I say that not to, to point fingers at white folks. I just want people to know that they weren't black because <laughs> we got enough issues. And I say it, people will assume that because I'm black, they're black. No, they, this was a white family. And um, this little girl who was, you know, he, the, the kid, and then he had an older sister. Um, but she seemed to, I noticed when I would go over to this house, she would be the one that caught all the hell. And that's not unusual sometime in, in families where there's some kind of abuse. They, they pick one kid that is always the, the scapegoat for stuff that, they, you know, they couldn't possibly have been the problem. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like, is she five or six? What are you doing? Um, so anyhow, I saw this and then I remember going home to my at my house and my dad comes home from work and at the time he had he he was still on the uh he still worked for the pittsburgh uh police force as a detective in the juvenile division uh, and he carried a gun he had a badge he was a tech he was a detective and um so i told him i was like dad uh i went to so-and-so's house and they had gagged and tied the uh, girl, I won't even say her name. Uh, it wasn't Tracy, but so I'll say Tracy. Gag and tied Tracy on the floor. Uh, you should do something. <laughs> and my father said to me, I can't mess with those white people. And that was, that was such a moment of understanding. You got a gun. You got a badge. You're on the force and you are afraid to go down and deal with, you know, it, it wasn't like, well, legally, you know, I'd have to see it. or It wasn't any of that. It was just they're white people. I can't mess with them. They're off limits for me and my badge. Um, and it, and it was like one of those moments, like, you know, you, when you're a kid, you, you, you grow up with your parents and you're like, well, they're, they're very powerful, they're this and that. And there's always a certain point where you realize they're not infallible, they're human, and they, they make mistakes. Uh, but this was learning, not just that, but where you were in the socioeconomic system and how a black man who was given a certain amount of power still could not 
could not use it or at least feel comfortable trying to use it against a guy. And I mean, like, it wasn't like this family was connected to anything. They were just poor white people. Um, the, 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 the father of the kids wasn't there. They lived with the grandparents. It was a mess. They were a dysfunctional uh, family, a very dysfunctional family. But he couldn't do anything with it. And that, that really informed a lot of how I started to look at the world. And then when you look at that particular, uh, that particular part of Tales from the Hood, now, that, that's not a, not a white family in there, but I had also relatable. seen, <laughs> yeah, I had also that's seen this you know? in, 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 our, in our world, you know, the, the, the kind of over, the kind of hyper-masculinity that causes men to feel like they have to dominate, you know, either kids, their woman, uh, that is, is, you know, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's a it, bad it, it thing. It touched on a lot of things and it's probably, I'm not sure if you did this uh, purposely or just happened. I think it hit even more that David Allen Greer did it because people know him as a comedian. Oh yeah. So I think, I think the part hits even more and it's just the whole absentee father, high probability of abuse. You know, the boyfriend comes in, the woman wants, you know, that type of protection or that nurture or love, and they kind of let things go that shouldn't be going. The child's interp interpretation of this dynamic, like, you kind of covered everything in that scene, you know? Yeah, and, and it's, you know, it's something that you, you know, that, that ha obviously happens in our, our community. And uh, it, it's interesting that when we screen tested the film, and the original cut of that, uh, there's a beating that David Allen Greer, when, he, when he's beating Paula J. Parker, um, was even longer. And the, the ratings board kind of made, said, we're going to give you an X if he <laughs> beats her. I was like, I, I, I didn't have the power to fight it. I wish I, I did. Because what happened when we screened that the first time, because uh, there was a lot of young, young kids in the audience, and when he first starts beating Paula, takes the belt off and he starts beating her, they would laugh, they started laughing, you know? And what happened was, as that beating went on, the laughter got quieter and quieter till you could tell that they were on the verge of tears. And it was, it, it was another thing that was like really instructive to me about us black folk, how, we, how we're seen and how we see things. So, and the reason I say that is because, and you may remember this, when Schindler's List came out, there was a, a screening, I think it happened in Oakland, where um, the black kids that were screening Schindler's List, they were laughing, they were goofing at some of the stuff in the movie. And, oh my God, you know, it was like people you know, they're, they're ready to go up there and march on these black kids. But what they didn't realize is, and what I realized as I watched how this played out, was this is a defense mechanism. These kids, they, they see abuse. That hits home, bro, so they got to put on that they, fake laugh. They got to put on the fake face. And even if they're seeing it from a Jewish community, it's still the same thing. It's like, still I, hurts. it still hurts. I can't let my boys, this girl I'm trying to hook up with, see me feel this, see me be affected by this in a way that makes me look weak. And, um, uh, but once again, that, that plays into, you know, what I was saying, this, this, this need, especially for black males, to feel like they're not allowed to show emotion. They're not allowed to be vulnerable. And what happens is they take it out on things. They'll either take it out on the people that they should, that they should love. Sometimes they take it out on themselves uh, through you know, any number of 
bad habits, uh, or they, they may take it out on their community. Um, and that's, that's something that, you know, uh, I think is, is really something that we need to, 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 to fight against to, or, or figure out. But it's a, it's a, a systemic problem uh, for us, I think, in, in how, we're, how we're raised, how we're viewed, how society kind of looks at us and our need to be able to, um, our need to be able to rise above circumstance. And sometimes you have to be strong to rise above circumstance. Sometimes you got to be so strong, you don't know how to be vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's one more thing I want to touch on that scene, your use of uh, stop animation instead of the DGI. Um, it kind of <laughs> it brings that creepiness in it. And it's I, also like, it just looks more, you know, like it's more, more disturbing, I think. Yeah, I mean, and, and Tails, the doll, um, and of course, you know, at the time that we did this, we, it was the only option that we had was to, to use stop animation. There's, there's a little bit of, uh, I guess, what you would nowadays call digital work, but just when Clarence Williams turns into the devil and his tongue comes out, it's the worst looking effect in the movie because it looks so cartoon like and you know uh, digital work has become you know come a long way that said I'm really glad that we didn't have the opportunity to to make the dolls move through a digital process because there's something about seeing you know that the, the, the Kyoto brothers who were the puppeteers on this thing and built all these dolls had to shoot the doll, move it, move it, move it, take shot, 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 and put that together to make it look seamless. But there's something about that jerkiness that, that makes it look just scarier. Um, if it's moving too smooth, it's just like, eh, yeah, right right. whatever. All right. And uh, I want to ask, like, when you're working with an actor like uh, Clarence Williams III, right? Um, do you do you like direct them or do you guide them? Like, how does it work when you work with that caliber of actor? Um, if you have a really good actor, uh, you you discuss the you're discussing the scene. Um, as a director, you need to know where you want it to go, but you have to be open to to where they're they're coming from. Um, and and you and it's and like I think what you're saying is right. It's kind of like you're guiding you're guiding or you're given a road map to where you're hoping uh, things will go. Um, I'll give an example. I did a movie called 57 Seconds. We had uh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Yeah. And there was a scene where uh, Josh Hutcherson comes to Morgan Freeman's offices. Uh, and Morgan Freeman is like, a, he's like a, a Steve Jobs type character in this. He, he is the figurehead for this huge, uh, huge uh, computer and, and tech company. Um, and Morgan's character in the movie uh, sees Josh in the lobby. He comes to kind of get Josh in the lobby. And Morgan's like, when we were on the set, he's like, I don't know why I'm coming to get this guy in the lobby. This is my company. It's like a billion dollar company. I wouldn't come and get this fool in the lobby. And I said, no. I said, so I said, so you're, you're not, that's not what you're doing. I said, and you're kind of coming more like God. Now Morgan's played God, so Morgan's like, I don't want to be God. <laughs> That's how he said, it. I don't want to be God. And I'm like, okay, Mr. Freeman, <laughs> you're not. That's. Uh, let me explain. So I said, Josh is going to be down here. Um, you are going to be two. There, it was this lobby was like two or three stories high. And I said, it's like you've come out of your office. You're up there on this balcony, which I showed him. And I said, you're looking down on him. So I said, it's a power play. And he's like, ah, OK, got it. So you, you, know, you, have, to, you have to know what you want and have to be able to explain it. Um, and, and good actors will, you know, will work with that. Um, the actors. The, not just actors, directors, anybody, the, where you have problems 
with anyone creatively is if they are um, uncertain or fearful or, or they, they, they're not trusting in themselves. That, that's where difficulties generally that come. Sounds, <clears throat> that sounds like a universal thing with that insecurity. The people I've, I've met that are truly a master of their craft, yeah. they're very humble and easy to work with. But those who, I guess, have to put on this facade because they're not sure about their capabilities yeah. tend to be a little rough to work with. You know? that, yeah. that is very, very true. And usually when you see somebody acting out, it's because they've got some insecure issues. Yeah, they're not, they're not too sure. Uh, one, one last thing I want to talk about, uh, Tales from the Hood, right? Oh, well, two questions. Where did you find DeAndre Bonds? Because I think that was his first film. Robbie Reed was our casting director, and she brought DeAndre to the table. And uh, he was amazing. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, he came in, he read, and it was like, and the story that she told me, or maybe DeAndre told me, is like he met her, I don't know where he met Robbie, but he was like, what do you do? <laughs> Wherever they met, he was like, what do you do? She's like, oh, I cast actors for movies. Um, I'm, you know, paraphrasing. And he's like, I can do that, that shit's easy. And she's like, oh really? And he was right. <laughs> he's, That's crazy. He's just yeah, a natural. Do you believe man is evil by nature or life and environment pushes man to behave in a way based on our moral standards we would categorize as evil? I think it's a combination. I think it's a combination. I do think that in general, most people, most, 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 I think the reason that the world works as much as it does Notice I said as much as it does, okay, <laughs> is because generally people are kind of decent. They, they kind of want to get along. They, they, they don't want problems. They want things to move. There are some people who are just born with evil proclivities, and that's, that's, that's a particular thing. But there's also what happens when things start to fall apart, where society starts to tear at the edges. And now, you know, you, you've got you've to do things to survive. That's the, part, that's the part that most people don't get to uh, when this topic is brought up. I think people behave in a manner uh, because... I think behavior is based on where you're placed at. Mm -hmm. That's why I have this, this, this problem with morality in a sense. Like you can easily act moral in a certain environment when, when you have certain things provided. But how will you act when those things aren't provided? And is it even realistic for you to act that way if you, human survival is the first thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that those are, those, are good, uh, those are good observations because... You know, um, there are people that I, I know that I would consider maybe not moral to a fault, but more moral than most. In other words, like I have a friend who he found $100. He was just laying on the ground. He didn't keep it. Now, he doesn't know who this $100 belongs to. And I'm like, what are you going to do with it? He's like, when I don't know who it belongs to, I give it to a charity. That's pretty, I don't even call it ethical, moral. Most people wouldn't do it. Flip side, there's the people that just steal $100. <laughs> you know, so there's, there's all that and everything in between. But I, I do agree with you that um, when you put people in extreme situations, I see. I was a philosophy of religion major. I like philosophy, so maybe at some point I come back. We can talk more about this. But I, I would say that um, you know that's one of the things that is is really what you do when you're when you're writing stories. There, there was a there's a uh, what's his name uh, Robert Robert McKee who has you know does. Uh, uh, story writing seminars for, for film. 
And he wrote a book called, what's his book? Uh, I can't remember his book now, but Robert McKee. He's kind of famous. And I remember one of the things that when I took one of his, uh, one of his seminars that came up was how you reveal character in a, in a film. And it's basically also how you see character in life. Like the example I gave you about this person finding $100. But he said, you know, character is revealed in the circumstances where things aren't easy, where, where, where stuff goes awry. And he gave an example. I think his example was you have a bus where you have a, a, a felon, a convicted felon on the bus. Maybe he's being transported by a marshal. And you have a, a pastor, a reverend, uh, someone, someone of spiritual, uh, spiritual profession, of the spiritual profession. The bus crashes. It's on fire. What you might find is that the pastor, the spiritual person, runs out and saves himself. And the criminal is the one that tries to save other people. And that's extreme situations are where you see who a person or what a person is. When we were doing uh, Hollywood Shuffle, there was a moment like that, which was funny. So we were, uh, we were in a dance studio. We're sitting around in a circle. Uh, I, I forget what exercise Robert had us doing. We were, we were doing some kind of improv. And a minor earthquake started to shake. Now, amongst this group of people, there were men, there were women, there were couples. There were people that were trying to hook up. When the stuff started to shake, you saw some of the dudes get up and just leave the girl behind. And then the way they thought about it, and then they came back. But that's that moment where it's like, did you, you gonna keep running? Are you gonna, or, or are you the person that doesn't even run? That's just like, all right, everybody, come on, come on, come on, come on. You see who people are when it's not easy. And that's kind of like what you're saying is that you know, when, 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 when the world goes sideways and all of a sudden, you know, food isn't easy, money's not easy, who do you become? Who do you become and what do you do, you know? And what do you do? No, facts. And, that, and that's, right. that's really what all film, what good films show, by the way. You're watching a character go through something and you're like, what are they going to do? How are they going to handle this and that that's what makes that what that's what makes a story interesting for sprung right from what i understand trimark wanted you to make a black dumb and dumber is that true <laughs> yeah that's true and i i that's just not even you know and, and by the way i got nothing against dumb and dumber it's a funny movie um but you got to know what your thing is and i knew that that wasn't my thing um and and you know even the rom-com of it wasn't necessarily my thing. But I was like, okay, well, how, what do I hook into in this? I said, okay, well, let me try and do something that, you know, I'll, I'll have one dude that's like the crazy, you know, just the crazy dude, and one dude that's like kind of the more grounded guy. And I'll, I'll play around with what, whatever that means, you know, whatever, whatever that means in terms of relationships with, with, uh, you know, the opposite sex. Um, but I knew, I, I knew, in my opinion, I, I don't think I could have done, done a, a Dumb and Dumber because that's just not how my head works, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to talk about the Chappelle show, right? Okay. Um, so, all right. So you were dealing with the, the sketches from a director's standpoint. That was your assistance, right? Yeah. I mean, I would... Uh, <laughs> on some of the sketches, you know, I would give ideas and kind of, you know, throw stuff out to, to, to Dave and see if it worked. Um, like the, the Mad Real World sketch. There's a, I don't know if you remember that, but there's a scene <laughs> oh, in there. Oh, good. That's one of the funniest ones too, but oh, yeah. I want to start with this blind white supremacist fight. Okay, this is like good. the classic one everybody loves. So, all right, you get the call to do the show, right? And f from what I understand, this is the first sketch that you work on? Yeah, that was one of the first ones that they gave me. And, uh, you know, I loved it because it, it dealt with all the stuff that I like. 
um, you know, social issues, racial issues, black, white, all of that. That's my thing. So um, I, 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 th I thought the sketch was, was brilliant. You know, I, I brought whatever I brought to it. Um, but I love that sketch. And, and, you know, Dave obviously really liked the sketch. Um, I remember uh, that, you know, after we, we did it, uh, Comedy Central was like, oh, Dave, you can't put this in the first episode. It's too crazy. It's got to be in like the second or third. Let people get used to you. And, and Dave, who has never been afraid <laughs> to speak his mind, said, if it's not in the first uh, episode, I quit. The show hadn't even aired yet. He didn't even got all the money in his pocket from the first season yet. And he's ready to walk away from this thing. And so uh, it ultimately ended up being in the first show. And it create it, it would have been a good show anyhow if it hadn't been in, because there were good sketches. But it created the buzz. It's like after you saw that, you're like, this could go anywhere. There's no telling what this fool might do. He's just, it's just so out. What was the, I never heard anyone that worked on a show talk. What was the creative process like with that show? Um, a lot of it, so Dave would write with his uh, uh, writing partner, Neil Brennan. And they would come up with, they would come up with the sketches. Uh, sometimes people would give them ideas and they, they would, you know, play with it. They would come up with the sketches and they would send the sketches to the director. Um, for the most part, it was me and one other guy. Neil did some in the last season, but um, they would send, you know, I'd get a, a, like maybe six or seven sketches that they're like, okay, this is what we're going to do in this block. And I would, I've, I've lived out here. I fly back to New York. Um, we would, you know, I'd get the sketches. I'd scout locations. I would, you know, if I had any ideas of anything that might, you know, make something funny or, or make something work, you know, visually in a certain way, I'd throw them out to Dave. And then, um, and then you know, we would, we would sit down and have a table read. Uh, we would cast it. Uh, and so that was the first time I met Charlie Murphy and Donnell Rawlings and, you know, all these people when you cast these things. And, uh, you know, this is before Charlie became Charlie. And he was always a cool dude, uh, Charlie. Um, but he was living in Eddie's shadow. And, yeah, you know, and there was, got that older brother like that, man. I yeah, man, lot, his, man. his older rough. brother was, you know. And I remember one day driving home from the set with Charlie. I was in his, uh, whatever, car. he had some nice car. We, and anyhow, we were driving back. <laughs> he was... He was just giving me all kind of crazy stories and advice because Charlie had already lived a life. He was telling me what to do if I ever went to jail, <laughs> all kind of shit like this. And uh, I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going there, but all right, I'll, I'll, I'll bank it, I'll bank it. And he was like, yeah, man, you know, people don't know when Eddie was in school, you know, the only reason he did it, didn't get his butt kicked on the regular is because everybody knew he was Charlie Murphy's little brother. Cause he would go to school carrying a briefcase and wearing an ascot. <laughs> I was like, so he told me all kind of crazy tales. Um, and in fact, he told me at lunch one day the Prince story and the Rick James story, and that's how it ended up getting into the show. Cause I told Dave, I was like, Charlie just told me this incredible story about Prince and Rick James. And Dave heard he's like, I'm putting that shit in the show. <laughs> Bam, it was in. Um, so the, no, the question I have is, how much of the story did not get? In the show, I, I, it, what you see in that show is verbatim what Charlie told me at lunch. He, we were just sitting at lunch. I think we were doing a player, uh, what was it, Time Haters, where they would all dress like pimps and you know and go around. And, and we were just at lunch, and Charlie just he was like, "Let me tell you about the time I went up to Prince's house to play basketball." <laughs> I was like, "Okay." <laughs> Let me tell you about the time that Rick James, and I was like, okay. He said he had a bad cocaine problem. <laughs> so he how did, how did Charlie Murphy even end up on the show? He ended up on the show. The first one was, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, um, Mad Real World. 
So he was cast in a mad real world. And uh, that was an interest. I think that was, I'm pretty sure that was the first one. I'm pretty sure that was the first one. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that was the first one. And that I, 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 unless it was, nah, it had to be the mad real world. Um, but anyhow, Charlie, <laughs> Charlie and, uh, was it Charlie and Donnell? Uh, I'm trying to remember because there was a scene where, you know, uh, the, white, the white dude that came to live in the house with all the black people, because it was just flipping the script on the real world where yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah, yeah there was always, always one black, black person, person, they always made him look blaming, nuts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> they were like, okay, it was going to be all black people and one white dude's going to show up. But then when he showed up with his girlfriend, they, they had this kind of beat in there that, you know, they were kind of like looking at his girl. And I remember that that's like one of the things I had. I was like, oh, we can, we can make more of that. So it was like, it went from them looking at the girl to her like being down with it and getting in bed with him while they were doing her. And he's like watching this looking all sad. It was just, it got really crazy. But Charlie, Charlie came in and, uh, he, you know, he was, he was just Charlie. Charlie is just Charlie. Or was just Charlie. He, that's, I was so sad that he's gone, but he was just a cool dude. All right, and um, I wanted to ask you too with Dave Chappelle, right? Um, do you think he's more brilliant writing the sketches or with the filming or as a stand-up comedian? Or he's he's just, brilliant. In both? He's just he's just brilliant. He's a really smart guy. Um, Self-learned, I guess, a lot because I don't think he went to college, but he reads a lot. I remember he told me a story about being at a party with a bunch of super intelligent black folk and white folk. <laughs> he said that, uh, uh, I'll mess it up because I'm not as smart as Dave, but he said that, you know, they, somebody was doing a quote and they quoted, they quoted uh, a poem. I can't remember the poem, but at the end of the, the person said this, uh, I think it was uh, Maya, An Maya Angelou. She made this quote. She said, blah, 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 blah. You know, kind of that Maya Angelou voice. Yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then she said, Langston Hughes, such and such and so and so. And Dave said to me, he's like, and she said, the one poem I know. And I'm like, no, nah, I doubt that. He said, but I knew it wasn't Langston Hughes. So I said, excuse me. That wasn't Langston Hughes. It was, the poem was X, Y, and Z, and it was County Cullen. And he said, everybody would sign. He said, that's right. I corrected America's poet. <laughs> so Dave is just a smart dude. Do not be fooled by any shenanigans or anything like that. The guy is brilliant. And uh, he, he knows how to, he knows how to frame things. I wish he would go back and do some more sketch stuff, but I love all the stand-up. He's just a brilliant man. And what was that like for, uh, I, I, obviously he said his part, but what was that like for, no one talks about the people that were working on the show, what that was like when everything stopped? For a lot of people, it was uh, depressing. Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, they're abrupt, making money. Right, bro? It's just like, it's, it's riding high, it's the best thing ever, and it's just Yeah, over. no, for a lot of people, it was, it was very depressing. Um, I... I, don't, I wouldn't say I was depressed. I was obviously, I think, a bit disappointed, but at the same time, I was like, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's messing with Dave so much that he needs to walk away from it, then he needs to walk away from it. What was the issue? They wanted him to do more extreme stuff or he just didn't want to do it anymore? Or what was the story? He, I think he had an, he, he just, this is what I, I think it was. You'd have to ask Dave. Um, the first season, I remember talking to him and he would be like, you know, his attitude was, I'm sticking it to the man. Yeah. I'm saying, you know, because they didn't want the blind supremacy sets to go on. Second season, we did the Nigar family, if you remember that one. And <laughs> that was crazy. You got to do this as well. Yeah, they did not want that to go on. And he forced all this stuff to go on. So he was like, I am forcing them to, 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 I'm forcing my voice on these people that don't want it. Yeah. 
But then the third season, where they're offering him $50 million or whatever, he, I think he felt like, wait a second. Am I really, am I really tweaking them that much? If they want yeah, yeah, yeah. give me fifty yeah, million, they're more, like, yeah, yeah. "Atta boy, keep it up." So yeah. he started to question the value. I think of this is my opinion of what he, of what he was doing and how it was being perceived, and I think that was the big problem. So, you know, if uh, he's a he's an artist, man, so you you gotta just kind of respect his process and what he needed to do. He needed to step away. The attention span in our society is at, I don't know, 3%, 5%, right? Um, do you feel our current society has the attention span and mental capability to watch and process a good story in a movie? Yes and no. Yes and no. I, you know, I see my kids, they're, you know, even my, even my wife. I mean, it's like, the, I'm like, what are you laughing at? Oh, this is the Instagram, <laughs> you know, and they're just flipping through stuff. And I do, I, I do think that people's attention spans are, are shrinking some um, because of the way we're, we're consuming information now. Uh, I think where it hurts the most, in my opinion, I think it hurts in the arts, obviously. Um, when you, you know, you, you have people that, you know, you, you can't, it's like that movie's two hours. Ah, I can get. <laughs> I, I can't even forget about it. You know, I, or or a book. How many people can read a book anymore? It's like they if, get, get try and get them to read an article, you know, or 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 something like that. So, but where it hurts is in is in news and and consuming. Knowing how to consume uh, current events, knowing how to consume uh, science, knowing how to consume what's important, because people don't have the, 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 won't take the time to sit down and really read something and absorb it. So you're getting your information from YouTube, no shade on you, because these are nice long ridiculously long <laughs> interviews that you do. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's like, I, I read an article today in my news feed about YouTube shows that are, are uh, YouTube, YouTube channels that are creating a false AI black celebrity stories. And they're getting tons of hits and make a gank of money. And the story is a complete BS. You know, there's, there's you know, uh, I won't even say the names, but it's, it's BS. It's bull. And the, so the, 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 the need to consume stuff so fast and accept things uh, without doing any kind of critical research, which is more important now than ever, because there's so much, there's so many lies, which is why I was saying I was impressed with some of the questions that you had. Because people just don't have, they, they won't take it upon themselves to, to try to discern what's real or what's not. They get their information from shady places or from, or, or just from any, any social media, X or Twitter, whatever they want to call themselves now, and all this nonsense is like, you can't. Society is slowly falling apart because no one, some people know what's real, but too many people don't know what's real and assume that some shit is real. And then a lot of people just don't care. And, and you mentioned this word critical earlier, man. This, this, this critical thinking is, is a, it's just a lost art that's not there, you know? It, it really is, and it, it's like you know what's interesting is like because I, I write and I've, I've been I, I I've been trying to uh, I write mostly scripts, but I've been starting you know playing around with short stories and other things, and <laughs> what you see in some of these things is like well you should write you should write for a fifth grade level 
for most people. Yeah. And I taught in I taught in public school and the seniors that were graduating were about fifth fourth, fifth grade reading level. And they were graduating high school, by the way, going right. into society. Right. Some and going to college. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and yeah. some, some, yeah, some writing, uh, some writing advice now is you're, you know, you got too many big words. <laughs> no one's going to understand you. You go back and you look at what people used to read. You look at how politicians used to talk. Half, half of our country, more than half of our country, wouldn't understand what anybody was saying because they just, the, the, the art of, well, it's not even an art, just the, the, the you know, e even people who didn't go to school understood these words. They, 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 their intelligence level uh, for language was just, raised and the put way like, they consumed put it like this the, our local paper the star ledger for new jersey was at an eighth grade reading level and this wasn't the new york times right and no disrespect to the star ledger but it was at an eighth grade reading level right and and probably a lot of people now would find that challenging very difficult you know yeah and that's that and so you know when you have a society with no critical thinkers you end up with Make America great again, and red hats, and a bunch of nonsense. And it's, it's, it's depressing. It's depressing. And, and it's, it's crazy, because you see, you know, there's nothing worse than seeing white people at these damn rallies, uh, black people at these damn rallies. That's, that's the biggest insult. That's the biggest, like, are you kidding me? But, you know... I, I think that they, <laughs> you remember, you know, how they, they would have tests for uh, black people to be able to vote. They need to bring that shit back for all these white folks. Because I guarantee you they could not, half of them don't even know who Abraham Lincoln was or the first two presidents. They don't know what, a, what the Constitution is or why or any, they, they, they're, Donald Trump's cult of personality is the perfect thing for how people consume their news and information now because he's nothing but a constant soundbite. And he says the same thing over and over. And people that, wanna, that, that don't want to read or don't want to learn, they accept it. And it's, uh, it's, you, it's, you know this, man. You know this. Everything works perfectly. You know, everything's working as intended. Uh, yeah. If, 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 <laughs> <laughs> if the world falls that's apart. how I really analyze the world because um, what you have to remember too, what you see, everyone doesn't see because you see more because you have that. You're a director, you're a creative person. So uh, a lot of times what we see is not what the average person sees. That's true. That's true. I we mean, can analyze. I think the gift is to analyze stuff while you're in it, while other people need to be distanced in time and space to analyze something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, I, and I hope that like some of the things that I do, you know, not not all the film work that I do, but the things that I write, I'm hoping that it touches on something, you know. Uh, I think uh, the, the greatest compliment that I ever got from anybody about any of my work was I had met a couple of uh, people at different times that said they stopped gangbanging because of Tales from the Hood, because of the, the story with Lamont Bentley and Rosalind Cash and that whole thing. They're like, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm the problem, or I'm part of the problem. And, and you know, you could argue that you're put in a position where you feel that that's what you have to do um, to get by, but not everybody makes that choice. So, you know, it's it's not a it's it that's not the necessity. And and you know, l let's say you do need to steal to get your milk or to get your bread, but you don't have to kill. You know. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that everybody that, 
I'm not saying that, that you know, you, you can, that the world is so perfect that no one can ever do something that is uh, uh, considered a, a criminal act. But, you know, murder, killing your own, killing your own community is not necessary. That's and my opinion. I, I, I'm not. I'm gonna let you go, but we gotta link up again to get into this philosophy. Also, we gotta talk about that soundtrack, bro. Like, how oh, did sure. you get that soundtrack together? You know, yeah, it's pretty I'll wild. So, be glad to. Be glad to. Yeah, so, please. Well, please. I, I, well, I appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much. It was a great reason. We have the link, and hopefully, in the future, we could bring you back to talk more. You know, that would be dope, man. Linton, thank you very much, man, and good luck, uh, continued success with the channel, because I. I hope people check it out because obviously you're a deep thinker and, uh, you know, people, people need to hear something other than, <laughs> other than the bullshit that they hear. <laughs> no, we appreciate that, bro. Thank you so much. Man. All right, man.